This week's episode was brought to you by Martha Nunez Puzo, Caleb Niehaus, Lawless Imagination, Pigliosis, and Chris Petrie. You are amazing. Thank you. If you would like to be amazing too and support the show, please visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where just one Lincoln and Blazing Green back will earn you all our extended episodes, a 5x5 five five vinyl sticker of our cover art, access to our Discord server, and for a limited time, a holographic circular rabbit clan sigillum sticker made by Mari Sama herself. This week, we're joined by author and alchemist Joff Hunniff, author of the recently published The Spaces In Between, a journey into self-evolution and discuss the wisdom folded into its pages. From mushrooms to fighting to polyamory, we explore the balancing dance of living a full and fulfilling life. On the extended show, we talk for an extra hour about alternative relationships, polyamory, and the challenges inherent within. If you'd like to get the straight dope, please be sure to visit jeffhunniff.com and pick up the book. It's inspiring, well-written, and succinct. Best of all, it's affordable and available on Amazon. Check out our show description for links. Thank you and enjoy the show. Ooh, you got any magical secrets for uh, healing migraines like Jesus level? <laughs> oh no. Uh, I just remember when I was studying in Chinese medicine there, migraines was a tricky one. It can be very tricky to deal with there depending on what's the cause of it. And there, there can be many different causes. So it's a uh, off the cuff, Jesus level saving that sort of thing. I got nothing for you, unfortunately. You just make sure the Black & Decker is fully charged and just, <laughs> just, <laughs> Darren Aronofsky oh. style, just straight to the temple. Mm. That's so sorry what, to hear about that. It's no, it's cool. It's like it was right when you, uh, I was getting ready for the show. And you were like, "Hey, man, are you ready to, to do this?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm starting to feel a little better." And then I got like, I still like projectile vomiting, and I was like, "I'm not better. I'm not better." And it was like, because you sent there, like, "I hope you get better quick," and you crossed your fingers, right, in the text. Yeah. It yeah. Uh, it, it happened a little too quick. I'm better now. Too quick. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. I I think okay, you well, might. Ha- that was good. You might have some telepathic magic healing powers. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, I, I hear migraines can be terrible. I've, I've once came close, I believe, and I was getting ready for uh, I, what I believe was an ayahuasca trip, and uh, ended up um, the day before I was fasting and getting ready for it, and I just was hit by this severe headache out of nowhere. That I never, never get headaches for ever. And uh, all of a sudden, it was just like, I hear what people talk about the light and how it's so like painful to be around. You just want to be in darkness and all that. And I was like, wow, really? Like that, it seriously, it hits people. That, and I'm sure I didn't have a very hard experience of migraines either with it. Strange things for why it comes out of the blue. And it doesn't seem like we have a very good answer for how to get rid of them either. And that went away right before your ayahuasca trip? Like you were ready for it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was a bit concerned over the fact that I was like spending the entire day beforehand uh, vomiting. <laughs> I threw up a little bit there. Uh, it was I just spent the entire day sleeping, and and I'm just like, okay, well, I guess I'll just I'll just sleep it off there, and hopefully by tomorrow I'll feel better for it. The next day I did feel better. I was fine for it. Got there, and um, it ended up being it ended up being <laughs> due to a lack of communication in the experience of it. There, it was a mushroom experience, not an ayahuasca experience. Oh my goodness! Um, right, right, which was a bit. Dis- I, I'm I'm very accustomed with mushrooms. That's a very common uh, experience I, I've had, and uh, ayahuasca is a unique when I was wanting to have that. And so I think due to a lack of um, direct communication over what exactly the quote unquote medicine would be, because uh, they often would use the word medicine to describe you're going to take this medicine and, and then you're going to have this experience. But there's no discussion over what exactly it is that you're taking. Oh. Right. And so it was contacted through and um, you know, it was a meetup called Ayahuasca uh, House of Canada or something like that. And uh, so you assume making contact through there that it would be I- Ayahuasca. <laughs> I yeah. did that assumption. <laughs> uh, turned out not to be. And that, you know, that's okay. But interestingly enough, though, um, I didn't have an experience on it. It was it was a super bizarre moment where uh, he ended up giving me eight grand to sit with the shaman. And I'm sitting there and about two hours in, I feel like I'm sitting there with a blindfold on waiting for something to happen. And I'm like, is, is something supposed to happen? And he looks at the time. And he's like, yeah, like, if you haven't had something by now, um, probably not going to have something happen sort of thing. So we start kind of winding down the session and kind of talking a bit more about it. And then it ended with me just kind of leaving after about three hours being there. And, and that was about it. And I don't know. And I've asked other people before about this no experience experience. Um, 
don't know if you guys are that much familiar with any psychedelics and, and the experiences with them, but I mean... Not that uh, much. Every, okay. Interestingly enough, every now and then, you just don't seem to have an experience on it. And the reason a rhyme is extremely baffling, as uh, as I've been trying to find an answer for my own experiences when I've encountered these moments where just you'd have no experience with it. And when I was looking into, uh, in particular, I thought it was interesting in people who go down to Amazon for like an ayahuasca experience, they often follow a fairly regimented diet and protocol leading up to the, 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 the session or the experience. You know, everybody's eating the same thing, understandably, with we're talking about different kinds of compounds that can have effects on the mind. Things like food can affect the outcome of it there in terms of like, just like with alcohol, right? If you go to a buffet and you eat all you can right before going, you could probably drink a lot more than if you're going on an empty stomach, right? In that same sense of it. Mm -hmm. So um, so you end up, uh, everybody's eating the same thing. Everybody's following the same kind of diet and practice. And yet within the group drinking the same brew, you'll have some people that just don't seem to have an experience. And when, when you ask around for like, so what's the, the leading theory on that? <laughs> Um, from, from a shamanistic perspective, it seems to be a bit more of like the kind of potentially chalk it up to a bit of like the mind may not have been able to let go and kind of get more involved in the, mo the moment, so to speak with it. Um, but what I find difficult is again, like mushrooms, eight grams of mushrooms, that's a, a fairly large dose that it's a good luck. You're just going to muscle your mind through and stay sober in, in that dosing of it there. That's not something that, that would be it's a typical thing that. So yeah, it, it sounds like you had a bit of a bad trip, but in reverse, like you got the symptoms before you took them. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, and trust me, I've done 22 years of mushrooms. I've been, I've been with there. And so I, I got very well versed in mushrooms and, uh, never experienced something like that before. And so I was quite surprised and baffled by the the whole thing where again, I'm like, I've had plenty of times on mushrooms where I have not had a problem letting go if that's the case of what it was. I completely fasted the day before because I was throwing up. I couldn't hold anything down. So it wasn't a matter of being stuffed. I really was like lost on a reason or rhyme as to why this didn't take an effect outside of, I don't know, maybe I was tense because I was with some guy and, and that I don't know. Like, I, you know what I mean? It could be something like that, but I'm, again, I'd be a little hesitant to say that like, that's going to be enough to make you stay completely sober. Well, you thought you were going to get the ayahuasca. I know. Here they come know, in with was, the mushies. Right? He has been just ball to eat. And I'm like expecting a excuse drink. Excuse me? He's like, excuse <laughs> yeah. me? You're like, you're lucky he, they didn't just hand you a cup of doTERRA oils. Right? Oh, no, absolutely. So unfortunately, it was, I think, again, due to the fact that there's a lot of um, clandestine elements around these experiences because it's all under the, 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 the radar, so to speak. Um, it's difficult to have direct conversation around it. To say like so what is it that's going to happen what are you giving or what is it that will be taken or whatever that makes sort of thing sense. that's the main it's it's a very uh tricky area right now <laughs> you have to talk to somebody of, to know somebody to like get in on their good yeah. side to get offered the doTERRA oils in the first place hello everybody and welcome to the whole rabbit where we don't just sign up for a free trial at the local gym and get a personal trainer because we have to pay people to hang out with us no we dissect ourselves under the microscope of brutal self-analysis Analysis, try new things like suspending ourselves with flesh hooks and choke our breathing partners until they learn to deal with it. Because this week, I'm joined by our friend and special guest of the recently published The Spaces In Between by Jeffrey Honef. Is that how I say your name? My goodness. Nailed it. You got it. You got it. You, that was good. That was great. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure to be on your show. This book is so well written. It just reads like clear, clean water. It goes down so easy. I love this book. Oh, thank you. That, that means a lot to me, Luke. Thank you. Thank you to hear. I'm glad to hear that. And you you broke it up all fractally on us. So you you present to us these three basic ideas and you're like, we, we got the sphere, we got the cube, and we got the pyramid. And then you break up like your chapters that way and there's like three books within the book, like the book of the law. And it's actually... It's fairly brief and it kind of does like I, uh, it's I love it. That's all I got to say to be. I honest. really appreciate I really appreciate the visuals, though. <laughs> Thank you, guys. For real. Oh, I, I, I'm very glad you hear it, that because it makes sense. Each 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 area, the pyramid, 
the sphere and the cube each have a certain feel or an uh, an elemental quality about them. You execute the theme very well. Excellent. Oh man, you guys oh just the oh, my heart. Oh <laughs> thank you, thank you. And so in short, it sounds like this text, the spaces in between, you're giving us your expert advice on how to not live like the Reese's monkey in the pit of despair. That's very well put, yes. It was partly from like um my, my, largely from my own personal experiences growing through uh my 20s and 30s uh getting to my 40s now just hearing my stories go back from as a trainer and i'd be working with other people older people from uh you know getting to retirement and such and they'd be making comments about their lives and how they wish they'd done things differently or they wish they'd spend more time on things or common thing that was coming up was that they wish that they weren't so ashamed or embarrassed about their bodies when they were younger as you know oh, wow. the saying youth is often wasted on the young and so unfortunately a lot of times there was a lot of refrainment from engaging with the body and various ways, whether it was through just being more free and open about it or being more expressive with it. But it, again, I'm not just saying it was with the body, but I mean, you get into relationships and all sorts of things that it ended up being much more that people felt bad, but more about the things that they didn't do than by the things that they did do in that sense. And it was partly because they followed suit with what everybody was kind of telling them to follow with, to, to continue to go down that same road that their their parents did, right? And so you end up having this continual pattern that goes over and over. And you end up, it's very easy to see how like five, 10 years down the road, doing the same thing over and over again can be very easy. And all of a sudden you realize in the future that all of a sudden you're, you're living a life that is not yours, the one that you didn't sign up for, the one that you didn't Whoopsie want. doodles. You know, and that's not fun. And then people are having all sorts of like, ugh, regret in that sense. Because hey, life, because do. life doesn't have a control Z or a back, like a rewind button on it. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. <laughs> so partly, it's like in the idea that, like, if looking at um, the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing over and over, expecting different results, and looking at the way the society is going about the regular routine of life with it, they're going in and out Monday to Friday on to the weekends, doing the same things with it. Um, if I don't want to be like the rest of the generic society in that sense i don't want to do the same things that they're doing and so that that requires this distinct sense of stepping out of the the norm the conformity of things and being more open to the the unknown and uh in that what my experience has been from that having that bravery to step into the unknown there's been so many more opportunities and experiences that offered growth right like that was the big thing that ultimately we're trying to grow through life and in these experiences that challenged my body my mind and my heart in all sorts of different ways i found that there was deeper and more meaningful growth that came from those experiences yeah and so i wanted to share right write them down <laughs> and i was like hey guys I thought this was a good idea. I mean, same here. <laughs> what I love about it is the spaces in between gives a practical overview of how to stay in balance. It addresses the body, the mind and the heart. And it just keeps it in the simplest terms, something that you can like for me. It's really easy for me to get caught in a rut and start doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I, I'm, I'm like the one who I'm on the animal farm and there's something going wrong and I'm like, I will work harder. And it, it doesn't always it doesn't always work out, you know, like sometimes mm. working harder isn't the right way to do something. Sometimes you have to, you know, put your heart more into it or just work smarter instead of harder. Be and dynamic it, it, in how you approach things. Create yes. do Try different things. And I love how you address play later on. And we'll get to that. But that's <laughs> I love how like work hard, play hard. That's actually the one of the truest statements. No, I, uh, as you're saying that with Luke, that, um, you know, the idea of working hard and, and if that's not working, work harder with it there. Um, that unfortunately within a lot of times there, that th not unfortunately, but that there is this wax and wane. Kind of what I'm talking about in the book is that this idea of balance or that middle ground, uh, I think is often viewed in the sense of a linear landscape that's on, on level surface. And it's just from side, one side to the other. And you're trying yeah. to find the middle and that middle is right in the center, right? Very, very obvious, right? Just very standard way of looking at it. If you take that, that same landscape and you wrap it around a ball the center is not on the ball but in relation to gravity now and so as the ball moves the center is not the same on the ball but it's staying consistent in relation to the ground right and so now to move forward or backward you you got to move the ball from front to back you exchange between yin and yang it's the yes. moving or the transit right yeah you get what i'm saying with that absolutely yeah right like like a circuit of energy mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right because a lot of yeah, because I find a lot of times when I'm trying to confront something that I struggle with, I have to go towards something that gives me distress or makes me feel uneased. Oh, yeah. And and that's an exploratory action. And then it leads me to the answer 
and to actually overcome any boundaries or to redefine my own boundaries. You know what I'm saying? Like Mm -hmm. you get to know yourself better by going towards the polar opposite of what you think you're about. But you can't force it. You can't force it. It said that. No, no. No, you have to be it, it, you have to be legitimately curious. It's very childlike quality, which, mm-hmm. which is has to do with play. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I'm trying to encourage people to be more curious and playful uh, within their approach to life, because in that approach, yeah. not saying that it's all about play. It's, it's this time and place for work. No. And so that's why I'm saying it's not about like A or B, but it's the exchange between A and B. It's this constant back and forth. And it's like like breathing is in or out better. And it's, at the end of the day, they're, they're kind of both equal. You kind of you can't stay in one state you have to exchange life exists between the exchange yeah. not not in either one alone and so that's where it comes back into that we often get stuck within these positions or patterns that we hold within our lives whether it's in the literal movement patterns that we have within work or our development in our sports or whatever or we're talking about the patterns of thought that we have within our minds or the relationships that we have and so a big portion of that comes back to like stepping out of the the norm of things it's really trying to be more enc- encouraging towards variation rather than consistency of the same. But yet at the same time, there's value within consistency. And so there's this back and forthness between these two things that are opposites, right? Again, it goes back Mm -hmm. to like all those esoteric and occult kind of ideas that are talking about exchanges of a yin and yang or duality of sexes and opposites and all that. So it was just like, all that made sense, but then you're like, yeah, how do you put that into practicality? And so it became a lot more from my experience as a trainer that there was all these polarities of things. Like again, like as a simple example, movement is produced through contraction of muscle. But if the muscle stays in a contracted state, it's no longer useful. In yeah. order for it to move, it must be in a relaxed state. And so movement occurs from the exchange between relaxed and contracted. And so again, the idea that you can't spend all your time in the gym, you actually grow in your sleep, not in the gym. Again, it kind of flips the whole idea about the stimulation that you get in the gym, breaks you down, but you recover in your sleep at night where there's nothing going on. And so if you're not sleeping properly, you're going to break your body down further and it doesn't heal properly and it just kind of erodes. And so there's this exchange. You need to have good sleep to complement the good training. But if you're not doing any good training, the good sleep doesn't develop you in the way that you would, you know, just sitting on the couch does does nothing for you but if you're i mean (laughs) if you're recovering that's fine but if you're trying to get stronger faster whatever it may be for a sport or for life whatever it may be with it there that again it comes back into that there's this constant exchange between things and staying on one thing this is the big thing is that like almost anything done for long periods consistently seems to produce bad things yeah Everything in uh, moderation. <laughs> including moderation. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. it, it requires to step out of that, right? Even within, because unfortunately, a lot of times within the idea of moderation is it's to stay in the center. And there's experiences to be had on the fringes, the, the extremes as well, that help to define a bit more of our understanding of where our center may be. The analogy that I use is a pitch black room and you're kind of tossed into it and you're, you're asked to find the center of the room and you, you can't see anything and you can only feel around in this pitch blackness. If you just stay in a five, by five square spacing of a 10 by 10 room you'll define your center by that five by five spacing that you've always stayed within but it's not until you go to the ends of those extremes of that five by five space do you kind of encounter the wall and to realize that it's not there that it extends beyond what you thought it was and so as you go to those boundaries you start to realize oftentimes those boundaries push back further they move the the world isn't so static and boxed in as we once thought it was right Yeah. Yeah, And you start to sculpt yourself, too, because you could also have extremes that you don't like that, you know, that you want to get rid of. And and if you propel yourself to the opposite extreme, wherever in your dark room, then your your sphere of influence will start to shift as well. Right. Because you have boundaries of like what you can and can't do or what Mm -hmm. you are willing or what you're not willing to do. Is that correct? Absolutely. And what you were saying, though, in, in through those experiences, you start to define and understand more of yourself. You understand you yourself. Your, you shape yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You, you shape, but you also become more aware of, like, as you're saying, because you, you have some boundaries. There are some endpoints where you you're can, like, no, that's you can not map cool. that and orient yourself. Right. But so often food people venture out into that space that they don't really know their boundaries, that they don't really know what they're okay with and what they're not. okay with. And they just keep going without analyzing or trying a different direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is something my Mm -hmm. art teacher in high school really put into me. He said, if you take a machine that's made to build, uh, made to lift 99 pounds and you put 100 pounds on it, it's going to break. But 
if you take a human and he can lift 99 pounds and you give him 100 to lift, he might struggle, he might suffer at first, but the next day he'll probably be able to lift the 100. And in, mm-hmm. the, in this text, you refer to this as the overload principle. Right. But, oh, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Yeah. And that's just the, it's as we expose ourselves to things that we can't do, we become the person who can. Yes. So you expand. Oh, well, you expand, too. You don't just define your limits. You, like, grow as a person, too. Because I always <laughs> liken it to, like, you're in a canoe. And, like, you you can explore the area in the dark with your canoe. But you can also choose to either go upstream or, or backstream. You know what I'm saying? Like, I like the canoe idea because you can explore more landscape. But at the same time, you're still in a boat mm. in a river. Mm. So once you go forward a certain ways, it's really hard to get back to where you were. If you made a certain decision to act a certain way, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. I super say, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. So, yeah, I yeah. Mean, like when you talk about the dark room, I'm feeling like I'm in a boat in a dark cave underground and I can't see anything and I'm paddling. Mm. Cause, <laughs> Cause like you say, once you go out of control on a certain extreme, it's almost like you get caught in a current, like a waterfall. Oh, so yeah. you have to be careful about, like, because I'm always about not exploring too quickly and to make sure that you analyze what you've already ex- experienced. Right. It's a bit slow, progressive, non-force exposure. Um, yeah. If, if you have, like, a, a, a person who's dealing with, like, a phobia, you don't just, yeah. like, surprise, here's a snake, and just throw it up. <laughs> <laughs> so what, is, what is the difference between forced exposure and, you know, spontaneous exposure? Like, uh, uh, like. Oh, so yeah, no, that's a good question in terms of spontaneous. I was going to say, in terms of like slow progression, that would be the difference between like stepping under a 500 pound bar, right? Something that's extremely heavily loaded that that you're not like people may not have been properly um, developed to deal with those types uh, of loads and you step under it and it can it can traumatize you. It can break you. No, not um, helpful. But if you. Right. But if you slowly worked up to it there, that same getting up to that same weight can make you stronger. Yeah. Right. So it becomes a matter of like, again, so in terms of like, so you're right. So the spontaneous element there, that's different from having a, because that's like you, you un, unexpectedly, uh, accidentally walked into a fairly intense experience. You got to kind of uh, want it. You got to kind of be curious, right? You got to like, be <laughs> attra- like magnetize to it a little bit. But you have to well, have a backup plan, too, in case you get overwhelmed. Plan. Well, there's a lot of things that you got to do. But at the same time, there's a part of, like, learning how to ride the wave. Um, and that's something that, like, a lot of times I found that uh, it's <laughs> it's learning or realizing that there's a lot of things that are outside of your control. And there's very few things that you can control. And in that, the world is going to be a chaotic and random place. And to think that it's always going to be static or stationary for you to engage with or deal with at a certain pace that's all set for you is unrealistic. As much as oh. we strive to set stability within our lives, don't get me wrong, I love stability. It's good. It's great. But at the same time, reality, life is in chaos. The, the world is chaotic in that in that more deeper sense of it. And so I think that there's a lot more of learning how to be more spontaneous and work with things that happen in the moment as opposed to always having a set. But it's good to have a plan. Don't get me wrong. You hear there that uh, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Right? Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's why you got to hit them first. You got to right? clock <laughs> them before make... they clock you. You got to yeah. know what to do if they hit you. <laughs> Oh, uh, and so, but, but that's just, and part of that comes from the exposure and being exposed to being hit <laughs> and, and, right. and learning how to manage, but at a pace that's more manageable that you can learn again, going back to the idea of movement, because all this is overlaying into the idea of mind and, and heart as well. But in regards to movement, when things happen on a fast pace, we go to a default mode where it's like instinct or reactionary. And when you're trying to change your reactive movement or reaction, you got to slow it down to allow for a reframing, to, to to break free of the habit that's occurring. Otherwise, it's every time that someone faints you, like, you know, psychs you out sort of thing, you're always going to have a, the same response until you've broken it down. And the only way mm-hmm. to break that down is at a slower pace. Mm-hmm. Much like uh, the analogy is often given, like um, a sprinter who runs by his coach, and he's like, coach, how, how'd I look? And the coach is like, I don't know, you're a blur. Like, let's, let's go to the slow-mo. <laughs> let's watch that and replay and <laughs> slow it down. And in the slow-mo, you get a lot more information. You can see the gait, you can see the stride, you can see where the knee's collapsing in or whatever it may be with it there that gives you that moment to be able to kind of analyze it and take it in a bit more. Same thing with our movement, aside from looking at a video, but when we move ourselves slower, we're able to take more information in and we're able to smooth that pattern out and regroove the desired outcome of what we were wanting to have happen. But it all comes from like taking steps back, slowing it down and, and retraining it sort of thing. And so I think in the idea of the snake being thrown at the 
the person with the snake phobia. That's a bit quick. It's a bit much. It's slower. Slower pace. Slower pace. You got to dissolve and recombine is what you're saying. Right, right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Which uh, I, I, I took from Crowley there where uh, he was talking about whenever you have a, a thought, imagine it's opposite. And in the marriage of the two, you have the destruction of illusion. Very I love cool. it. I love it. It's it very, it's great, it's great. He was, he was a man ahead of his times in many ways. <laughs> That's how your book is written. Okay, Josh, is, is there a, is there, a, is there a, a place that you got started? You were like, I'm gonna start with. Uh, you probably didn't think of it this way, but were you like a body guy? Yeah, yeah. I, I would generally say uh, I would probably be inclined to what people might call like a jock from back in the day. Uh, did but, you have an experience time, that made you go like wait a minute i have the force powers too is there something that made you <laughs> like is there any one I mean, thing or did you or did it like awaken through like becoming a better athlete no it had not so uh, the, the the physical portion i started working out when i was like i don't know 14 i think with my mom my mom was my workout partner <laughs> that's and, awesome uh, Right. It's great. It's great. And so she taught me about working out and being healthy and active and all that. And it was great. And I think especially when I was young and in the teens there, it was wonderful for relieving anger, frustration, all those things, teen angst, all that fun stuff there and provided an outlet to release that that energy and to direct it to something that was more positive. And it taught like elements of commitment and staying on things and moving towards difficulty and adversity and seeing how when you encounter hard things, they make you harder or they make you stronger, or whatever you want to call it sort of thing. It was that for sure. But then when we started getting into psychedelics, uh, again, I was about like 14, 15 years old around that time there. And uh, very quickly, I started realizing there was something else to this than what was the typical recreational drugs of like alcohol or even marijuana or anything like that. Uh, there was something distinctly different that made me realize, I'm like, wait a minute, this is this is not recreation. This is something else. This is something that's special. <laughs> it's special here, guys. This is something else. And um, as I continue with it, I started noticing that it was a lot of like these reflective moments where I couldn't help but think about relationships, my family, the people that I was seeing at the time, how things went from my past and how they kind of affected and laid out the way that my life was happening at that time. And then, of course, you start seeing from that how the things that you're doing now create the person in the future that you become. And so you start becoming, I, I found I was becoming more conscientious and aware of my life in these other abstract ways that had more meaningful outcomes because it wasn't just a matter of like afterwards it was like oh wow man that was like a total trip and crazy I saw like this kaleidoscope oh that I have no interest in like I could not care less about seeing pretty colors or shapes I'm sure that there's something meaningful about that but to me the experiences that were more revealing more insightful more challenging those ones that were the ones that I found that were more interesting that had more to offer and so I ended up pursuing that a lot more in my personal time. I realized I'm like, this is something else that I, I, I have to <laughs> understand a bit more of. And so I continue with that for like 22 years. I'm, I'm yeah, curious. It, it's is always it... got to learn something from it. Like for me, I always get I always learn at right. least one thing. But if you could learn a lot by doing something, that's that's cool. But it, it's really up to how you handle it. And oh. also like about laying back and allowing it to happen is pretty important to like oh. understanding what the lesson is. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I you mean, you smoked your first doobie at like 14. Who? Yeah. I was 21. I was 21. Nice. Joff's like, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably for the best. When I do take substances, it would be for, I mean, I would also treat it respectfully when, when I imbibe, but usually I'll get a meaningful message. It is visualizations and such, but the things that you see and what you perceive have to do with your inner dialogue and your inner world, which you're not really logically aware of that. Mm. You know, it's kind of like in your subconscious, it's your subconscious as Carl Jung or Freud would call it. Yeah, but no, it really, I, really, really visual. It gives you a visual visualization of what's going on inside of you and you can confront it however the hell you like. But it's still there. Oh, yeah. No. So just sort of clear on that as well, because I think there's a lot of hype around the healing effects of psychedelics and, and all that. 
Um, I by no means disagree with that. I think that it has profound effects and possibilities of helping people manage and deal with and, and work through uh, a number of ailments and issues. Um, but it certainly seems to be one of those things as well where it's it doesn't do it for you. It I found that it shows you things, and then from that you do something with it. Yes, you right. got to give like, a shit like in a, the first place. It's like a filter or like putting. It's like holding up binoculars to be like, can I see more things? They okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a great analogy that was given by I can't remember the guy's name. It was in the book Mushroom Wisdom, and uh, great. I don't know the author, but the book was Mushroom Wisdom, and uh, he gave the analogy of like you're walking along the streets, and all of a sudden this ladder just appears out of nowhere and stretches high up into the sky. You're in the desert, just say high up in the sky, and you climb up ten feet and you look around. You can see a bit further, right? You might be able to see a bit past the next dune, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. You climb up another twenty, thirty feet. And you can see much further now. And you see an oasis in the distance, right? You see something beautiful and wonderful and amazing, and it's marvelous. And and then you come back down, and you no longer see it. And unfortunately, a lot of times when people lose sight of it, they lose what that was about. They, they say, oh, I saw this beautiful thing, and, and now that I come back down, and I see that the world isn't what I thought it was, because that made so much sense. And this, this now is like reality, and it's not what I thought it was or what I saw. And they get disillusioned by it. But oftentimes, it's more of like, that gave you a sense of direction, right? When you were up Go high, there. Just walk that way. Right? Right? That's <laughs> oh, my it. gosh. You, you've got a sense of direction. Go there. Like, move because towards it's this. Because it's complicated, you guys. God. Guess what? No, it's not. Being <laughs> alive is. means change. Anything that doesn't change isn't technically alive. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. But you're, but you're talking about forces moving between each other. That's like a dynamism. It's it's movement. It is the definition of being mm. alive. Mm. And that if you want to grow as a person, if you want to change or like progress, you know, you're going to have to confront these extremes that you're talking about. You know, you're going to have to to see something and understand that it's not real, but continue to fight for it anyway. Mm. You know, you're going to have to like pursue things that you maybe think or like get into things that are maybe the opposite of what you like, just so you understand, do I really want this thing? OK, you know who you know who would really benefit from reading this book would be Lester Burnham from American Beauty. <laughs> <laughs> I bring that up because I watched that when I was nine years old. And I think that movie, to answer my own question, pushed me into like, I think there's more to life. Like just watching, mm. like, because I had seen that in, in my parents, you know, you get stuck in this rut and you're in this unhappy marriage and it's right, just like you're mood, a dead person, yeah. you know, you're just an like, automaton. And just, oh, yeah. uh, and I just watched this one uh, the year prior to that. Truman Show came out and mm. oh, his wow. whole he doesn't know that his universe is as small as it is until like the the culmination of the film is when he finally touches the edge. Right. Right. Like, he goes to the edge. Yeah. Yeah. And then he steps into the black void. Yeah, he does. He does. He's he afraid tries, at first. He tries yeah. to push his boundaries because he wants to know, is there any other way my life can be? And I think there's also the, the, the idea of transcending the, the hollowness of, of fakeness. That, that he wanted something real, that there was something that was undesirable about he this. something novel, something different and new. And that's where it gets into like aspects of, I just point out within relationships that like there's this constant dynamic tension between this idea of consistency, stability and reliability, as well as novelty, unprodu- n- novelty, newness and uh, mystery. As I would, the, the, yeah, 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 I would liken it to a very fine balance, almost like a dance, mm-hmm. because it's constantly shifting too. Even if you have the perfect balance between personalities, your personality shifts throughout the day. Does that, you know? Oh, so if sure. you have a relationship with someone, they have to understand you mm-hmm. and your extremes. Because a beautiful dancer is lean back and they lean forward when they need to. Mm-hmm. I find it's a great analogy because I. <laughs> I give the the, the 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 question another question. If you want to be a good dancer, I hear you want to dance with a lot of other people. We're talking about sex, who, right? Who me? Well, I, I was actually <laughs> talking about dancing, <laughs> but okay. this metaphor carries over for dancing. Well, you do dance with a lot of people because it's any relationship. It's not just a, re- a sexual relationship. No, no there, there's a lot more of understanding, getting to know. There's a acquainting yourself with, and of course, exploring and getting to uh, discover new things about people. 
and that's thought- it's a group dance too for sure for sure absolutely a good rave is going to include a lot of people heck yes <laughs> uh yeah no i so if you want to be a good dancer the idea is to to go and dance with many different dancers just because mm-hmm. you end up learning a lot of different nuances and differences between people from beginners to advanced to dance from men with men or women you learn a whole bunch of different things and so in that to always, or nuances to the way that they approach a dance with someone else you could say like oh i don't like a b or c but i'm gonna take d and i'm gonna use that but even by having the experience of the dance that you didn't do it for you you got a little bit of experience with it yeah that too you got better but also you learned a new technique because also this is how art works is like a lot of times you can't just sit in a void in a vacuum and just paint stuff and be good i mean maybe i can if you want to call it art but a lot of artists look at what other artists are making and then they make their own variation or Mm. iteration of that and they become successful Mm. So inspiration is a huge part. And a lot of times, if even if you're not dancing, watching other people dancing. Right. You pick up. That's stuff. a great pastime. We do that all the time with movies and TV and entertainment because we like seeing people in the dance of life because it mm. teaches us how to dance, too. Right. And. And then and it inspires us to go get some dance partners and go talk to people and be social because right. then we get more self-confidence to be able to go out there and be like, do you want to dance? Right. And, and, and then a big part, too, and this is always like there's lessons in all sorts of things, even getting rejected. There's lessons in that. No one likes getting rejected. Yes. Like how uh, to do it gracefully and right. not be a dick. <laughs> I'm totally. I'm just going to graduate school right now. That's all. I'm getting my <laughs> master's. Place. I'm getting my. Yeah. Give me a PhD. Oh, well, I'm getting my PhD. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a, a small handful of people. You mentioned psychedelics aiding in the performance of athletics, specifically the WWE. Mm, yes. <laughs> That's a <laughs> thing. That. that is that a thing for real? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh totally. So, so I was at University of Toronto for a symposium that was having all these discussions around psychedelics. And it ranged from like you know, microdosing to the ethics behind what's happening with the Amazonians and cultural appropriation. Like there's a whole bunch of things that were being talked about. And in that, uh, there was a, this discussion on microdosing. And during that discussion, I'd asked there if there was any conversation being had about people using it for perfor- physical performance enhancement. I know that like over in Silicon Valley that there's oh, a lot yeah. of talk about, right? All being the used for, right? Yeah, for real. Uh, and they microdose LSD and then also mushrooms. But we've right, all yeah. heard of that. I, I'm trying to get to the Mick Foley dropping acid. Part, you know what I mean? Like, where does that come in? Like, no, really. Like, because from what I understand, it's a lot like American politics where, you know, it's all decided in the room, like back in the, you know, and then they kind of mm. come out on, and they pretend like they're enemies and then they have like this fight. Right. And then it's like, oh, look, this guy won. Isn't it incredible? But sometimes they improvise and some, and right. then the, the blows sometimes actually hurt. I mean, because they're, I mean, they're not actually hurting each other, but sometimes the stunts they do result right. in them it getting be... injured and they can mm-hmm. actually seriously hurt themselves. And it's kind of like a theater. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering, like, do psychedelics help them be more spontaneous or have more energy or? that's uh, Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, from my understanding, again, I didn't get a chance to go super deep into it. I got that it was during their training, not when they were on stage, when they were performing. It was during the training period that they would use it for. You drill, it was, drill, 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 drill right, all day. Right. And you need so to wake up. It certainly provides energy. That's a big thing for sure. Um, what got me whole noticing on it there was uh, on a larger dosing, I noticed that my grip strength was like through the roof. And I was like, wow, what's, oh, what's this about? And well, that, uh, that primate instinct. Got hang on trees. to it. <laughs> you, well, doesn't it make you not used to it? So you overcompensate when you do it again. So it's almost like you're better at something. So you get, it makes you used to the feeling of making brain connections of being better at something. It's almost like you retain a higher, you're able to push your muscle memory. Right. There's some, and I, mean, I don't know if it's a matter of it being a stimulant that it, it 
heightens the the nervous system and and that causes a high recruitment of motor units like it could be something like that it was i noticed that there was an energy increase of energy but it was also like the grip and again when it comes to upper body strength your grip strength is like a direct correlation sort of thing uh if you can't hold on to the weight you can't pick it up sort of thing so it's, if your grip strength wow. is a key part to it so when i was noticing that i was like hey does anybody else know about this and uh, as I was looking around, <laughs> I was coming across, there was like, uh, aside from the WWE, there was historically, uh, there would be certain groups of people that would take psychedelics before going into battle to, to go fight. Wow. Um, the berserkers in the Viking community, they would, uh, they would that often. Makes a lot of sense. Right? <laughs> Hell <laughs> just yeah. Eat a bunch of, they'd have this concoction that was made of like alcohol and mushrooms and, and they'd drink that before going into battle and they'd just wear like a wolf pelt and, and a shield. That was it. And then <laughs> go at it. Uh, but um, in Africa, they were talking about how they have a whole plethora of different types of uh, psychoactive plants, but they have a variety of plants that are used for fighting, which I was like shocked by. And, and even further, they, they they broke it down into like fighting like hands, fighting with sticks, and then fighting with like, like bladed weapons, which I was surprised that they had differentiated the different types of plants. Oh, you're going to do some stick fighting, you take this plant. <laughs> um, that then, is course, amazing. South, right? I was very surprised by that. In South America, they they used it for hunting uh, with gross movement patterns and edge detection in the forest. Uh, it seemed to have aided in, again, like hunting movement, big athletic movements that were being used for it there. But it all comes back to dosing because if you take too much, you're not moving at all. Dude. Yeah, you're stuck. Apothecary. Old yeah. school apothecaries. Bring them back. Like, right? I'm, that would be, yes. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I the, the Black Knight. Counter. The Black Knight and Monty Python had been doing ketamine right before that fight. <laughs> yeah, no. he, he wasn't feeling much there. <laughs> okay, if aspirin, you could kill yourself with aspirin, but it has a label and tells you how to take it, right? Right. And so fortunately, <laughs> with at least with mushrooms, uh, they have not found the, the LD50. LD50 being the lethal dose of like you give 100 people this substance at that amount. How much will it be for 50 people to die of that 100? Oh, and uh, well, it's really not that toxic. No, no. It's well, I mean, usually like, the, cardiac arrest, I'm, I'm betting or something that has to do with the visions. Like we've got those numbers for cyanide. We got Jim Jones out there. Do the legwork like for us. Not, right. It's yes. The mushroom yes. Itself, it's the people reacting to it. If it kills them, it's them reacting. Yeah, because so I say they, they from lab studies with rats there, they, they kind of had ballparked the LD50 to be about your body weight, which is like, I mean, I don't know if you ever tried eating 10 pounds of anything. 10 oh, pounds. Yeah. Right. No. Right. So like, you're not going to get anywhere near <laughs> your, your, your lethal dosing with mushrooms. Also, when people are like, that's poisonous, it'll kill you. I'm like, yeah, if you drink too much water, it'll kill you, too. Right. Like, for sure. Now, come back. <laughs> <laughs> water can kill it yeah for sure uh the main thing with mushrooms is identifying it that, that's the, the primary issue like no one's ever died from eating psychedelic mushrooms psilocybin, psilocybin um now there but, are poisonous ones though right and and they can look very similar and exist very close to other psych psychoactive ones and that can be if you don't know what you're looking for and you're just wandering out in the woods finding mushrooms and just eating it don't do that uh but that could be a problem and that's where you would get and due to misidentification, have oh, a, cultivation uh, should be legal then, right? Oh, absolutely. This, I, is, a that, logical, that would... <laughs> this is a logical step. <laughs> oh yeah, but I, I, the research is being done. It's coming around. I think that bit by bit. I know here in Canada, and I know that some of the states in uh, down where you guys are at are starting to change over some of those uh, those rulings and uh, decriminalize, if not completely legalize. And hopefully, well, I think Was well. uh, Washington State has legalized all mushrooms. Oh really? Oh nice. Psychosybin. Oh yeah. See that you guys you guys are ahead of us. You're ahead of us. <laughs> well, we're, we're, oh, that's great. It's, I mean, it's decriminalized. I mean, but I mean they're not gonna get you. They all do it. Right. Uh, it's also from what I've been here. I mean, I just saw there's a there's a site here in Canada that you can order mushrooms online and it will be sent. And I came across a Vice magazine article that was talking about psychedelics and where you can get them and just kind of talking about the legalities and uh, acquirements of it in, in various countries. And when it came to Canada, they were saying that, like, well, you can order them online nationwide. And it doesn't look like the government's doing much of anything to stop it. Like that, yeah, was, they, that was the statement that they made. <laughs> But Sorry. it's a low priority thing. But you mm. can also get like lion's mane and right. uh, chaga, chagas. Yeah, yeah, chaga, yeah, yeah. 
So there's mushroom extracts that you can get legally um, as they call them um, nootropics, where you're trying to modify the way your brain works with really potent natural vitamins and minerals derived also, from plants. So it's yeah, plant yeah. it's plant medicine, basically. But it comes in a little pill like a vitamin. Mm -hmm. But you could even figure out like a lot of mushrooms actually help. Like I'm a creative person. I'm a graphic designer. So I have to use my creativity so much that something like a mushroom supplement would be very beneficial to my brain because you can't keep using, you can't keep having novel thoughts without having something interrupt the brain signal. Right. And that's where you, you get into this saying? constructive. Like you, have to, you have to jitter it a little bit so that yes. you get more creative thoughts after that. Otherwise you get into a block, which is called artist block or writer's mm. block. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. No. And that's like a major issue. I think a lot of people, and that's just from, from an artistic standpoint, but again, going back to like the, the overall aspect of life that it becomes like these blocks, these uh, routines, these patterns that we constantly yeah. fall into. And again, you get stuck. Right. And so a large portion of it is like, how do you break those patterns? And so that's where I try to talk about in my book. There are all these different suggestions that range from like physical things. And this is like it goes into so much deeper than that. But like it starts off like people ask, like, how do you start doing things differently? Is as, as plain as that sounds. You know, it's just literally start doing things inverting. Uh like Interesting. just start flipping upside down, reflect it or or uh, I thought about using my left side because when I drive, I sit or when I sit down. Down, I set my hips crooked mm. to a certain side, to my dominant side. So right. I'm thinking about pretending I'm left-handed so that I sit differently and lay differently. So doing opposite things, uh, it's a therapy of uh, pains or if you get stuck, like you can't, you're not flexible. You talk about yoga too. Right. Which yeah, is yeah. very cool because you can do poses. If you have a hard pose that you do, do the opposite of the pose and then try the mm. pose again. No, I, I, so even with like what you were doing there, like I find that it's unfortunately, it's so rare that people spend any time. This is where I find like magic is a really useful tool for the mind. Again, maybe I'm not interpreting it fully or properly or, or correctly, but like it, it certainly seems to me that it's a practice that allows us to engage with the mind in various ways, whether it's communicating with the subconscious or um, even just in, in what you were saying there, just to kind of this thing that irks you. Yourself or finding a way out of being stuck, like exploring different ways to be. Right. And that's where so much of that comes back into this, this unknownness. It's that shock factor. But again, the big part with that whole shock factor, this is, this is, this is it, is it's very difficult to do that when you're not willing, right? Like it, it needs to be a willing thing that you're willing oh, to. Want, like, and I've been like, I just want knowledge. It, I was afraid of experiences, but now that I'm older, I've become like, I'm now I'm okay with the experiences that come along with the knowledge. Mm. So you, you to have your boundaries have to be wide enough to where you can accept some of these it, like if you want certain kind of knowledge you have to have boundaries wide enough to accept it you know? yeah you have well, to be accepted, think, uh, classic, receptive yeah. to it. well because i think a lot of times it's 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 uh you also get within the quite what you're asking for many things that you didn't know that you were asking for and yeah. uh <laughs> think about so, it too long <laughs> Well, I just, I mean, I find that there's, there's times where it's sort of like, uh, I think the classic uh, desire is like, I want to know everything in that. It's like, you, you do understand that everything includes all of the horrible and insanely like terrifying things that are going on and that will go on in the future. And all these things that like, yours, I want to know all the amazing things. I want to know all the incredible things that are going to blow my mind away and just like totally rock my world. But you, you often don't say that. You say, I want to know everything. And that inclusion is everything. And everything is, it can be a terrifying thing in the, right. the entire span of it. Like what, what the all of all is, is, is so far beyond what I think my own little mind could comprehend with it there. And, and I've seen, I've comprehended some terrifying things in my time. I, I think I, that's one of the inside jokes of the Goetia. They're like, oh, ask this demon about the true story of the fall of the angels and the spirits of the Lamegaton or whatever. And it's like, mm. that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right it's like a that's a lot not only of stuff that, but our, our, fuck, our, our like flesh body meat bag vessels cannot even comprehend the immeasurable amount of omniscience 
Okay, like it, it could never happen. We would just explode like as if a gerbil put in a microwave. Sorry for that <laughs> trigger warning. Okay, you could put the trigger warning ahead of that, but yeah, you know, what I mean? like, there's no way that we could even contain that kind of knowledge. So, but to follow after it and to try and we're trying to push our boundaries here. Like there's mm. something admirable about that. Like, I know I can't comprehend this, but I want to, and I'm going to keep trying. Like oh, that's, that's compared to not to even trying. Oh yeah, no. I mean, that just I mean, just the fact that there's the attempt to want to know something that's beyond. I, as you're saying, I think is an admirable. It's like rate. a fish wondering what of the fuck a bird is, or like, can I be a bird, or like, mm. what, where do how ha, how do birds exist? Like, is bird are birds real? It's like a fish wondering that, and I'm like, yeah, of course I'm gonna keep being that fish. <laughs> <laughs> mm hmm. I want to be a bonobo. Wait, wait Can we till, talk about that? The, the, yeah, but wait till the fish finds out about rocket ships. <laughs> <laughs> and wait till the bonobo finds about found finds out about OnlyFans. What if the fish <laughs> what if the fish came on rocket ships, Mari? I mean the dolphins did. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. want to hear us talk about how bonobos solve problems versus how chimpanzees solve problems <laughs> versus how you probably shouldn't uh, take on polyamory when your relationship is already really brittle, you are definitely <laughs> going to have to go to www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit where five bucks earns you access to all our extended episodes, a, a bonus fancy sticker and access to our discord server where we have uh, now declined into the state of trading waifus because, hey, oh, no. Oh, no, in husbandos. Husband, that's the. I'm already winning. I have a Metal Gear Solid waifu. I got Olga. She has the furry arm. Hey, no. I don't even know who Luna is, but I got the spicy Korean pop singer girl. She likes bread. I can't eat bread. So we balance each other out. It's just a match made in heaven there. So um, tell us, tell us, Joff, where where do we get your book? Jeff Hunniff dot com. And the I book is, is called The Spaces in Between. Yes, a journeying into self-evolution. And if you have any self-respect, I don't know why you're listening to this show, but if you do, then please pick up this book. It's out there for a great price. It's a great read, and it's a great place to get started if you're like, I can't take any more of this. It's so easy to understand. Oh my gosh, I love how visual it is. Rat, I can't take any more rat dystopia, Reese's monkey pit of despair type living. If you if you <laughs> feel like Kevin Spacey, um, just jump off a bridge. But before you do that, get this I know book. where you are. Thank you, everybody. And Eat carrots and shoot lasers. And get the book.